the question, two questions. One, how could I call myself a libertarian socialist was a contradiction in terms, given the meaning of the term libertarian in the United States. Uh, and secondly, if I'm opposed to state-subsidized capitalism, what about laissez-faire capitalism, the kind advocated by Adam Smith, right? Well, you're right that the terms that I'm using are contradictory in the United States, but that's a sign of the perverse perversity of American culture. Here, the term libertarian means the opposite of what it meant to everybody else all through history. So what I was describing was the real Adam Smith and the real Thomas Jefferson and so on, who were anti-capitalist and called for equality and thought that people shouldn't be subjected to wage labor because that's destructive of their humanity and that... Uh, and the real Adam Smith, who said that uh, uh, you, a government, any, in any civilized society, something has to be done to prevent uh, division of labor because it will turn people into creatures as stupid and as ignorant as it's possible for a human to be, and who advocated markets only on the grounds that under perfect liberty it would lead to perfect equality. Okay, that's the traditional libertarian tradition that I've been talking about, and in that sense, yeah, I'm a libertarian. The U.S. sense is quite different. Here, every word has become has taken on the the opposite of its meaning elsewhere. So here, libertarian means extreme advocate of total tyranny. That's what libertarian means here. It means power ought to be given into the hands of private, unaccountable tyrannies, even worse than state tyrannies, because there the public has some kind of role. Uh, the corporate system, especially as it's evolved in the 20th century, is pure tyranny, completely unaccountable, uh, you're inside one of these institutions, you take orders from above, you hand it down below, uh, you're outside the institutions under what the libertarians want, there's no th nothing you can say, the tyrannies do what they feel like, uh, they're global in scale. I mean, this is the extreme opposite of what's been called libertarian everywhere in the world since the Enlightenment, and that's what's called libertarian here. So yeah, it is hard to talk here because like, you can't use words like libertarian or conservative or anything because they've all come to take their opposite meaning. Uh, as for Adam Smith and Wealth of Nations, well, you know, first of all, the idea of a unsubsidized, uh, not state-subsidized capitalism, we don't even have to bother talking about that. It, it has existed. It exists in a good part of the third world, which is why the third world looks the way it does. It has never existed in any developed society for a very simple reason. The wealthy and the powerful won't allow it, just as Adam Smith understood. Uh, they will use the levers of power to make sure that state power subsidizes them. That's why the England developed, that's why the United States developed, that's why France developed, that's why Germany developed, that's why Japan developed, and in fact, every developed society has developed just that way. That's one of the cliches of economic history. Uh, the uh, uh, so we don't have to talk about that because it's non-existent, it never will exist, except for people who have it rammed down their throats. Now, am I in favor of it? That's another question. Like in some mythical world, would I like to see laissez-faire capitalism? Well, only under the conditions described by Adam Smith, the real Adam Smith, you know, the one who wrote Wealth of Nations, not the one you worshipped before, but the one who wrote it. And if you look at his argument for markets, it's pretty clear. I mean, maybe the argument's right, maybe it's wrong, but it's clear what it was. The argument was, I repeat, that under conditions of perfect liberty, markets will lead to perfect equality. That's why markets are good, he said. They will lead to perfect equality, and they will not force people to subject themselves to outside orders, so they become less than human, so that, uh, you know, the artisan recedes while the art improves, as the Tocqueville put it. Yeah, if that were possible, maybe so. Uh, but uh, it's not in the cards. And I don't know if that argument works anyway. It probably doesn't. You know, the argument was fallacious. But, uh, if, but the goal was clear. The goal was a society based on enlightenment values, which is just radically opposed to uh, what today are called libertarian values here in the United States. So there you have to be clear about what you're talking about. But you're right. As I use the terms, it sounds contradictory in the United States. Like it also sounds contradictory in the United States when people ask me what I think about conservatism, and I say I think I'm probably one of the few conservatives around. Because I actually believe in traditional values. I don't know anybody on the public arena who does. So I don't know to the extent that the term has any meaning, I'm probably conservative. You know. But that doesn't mean much here. You know. 
we have to start by decoding a whole system of uh, you know intellectual distortion before you can even talk that that itself is a big achievement you know if terms have lost their meaning well you know it becomes impossible to talk uh, and that's itself an achievement doesn't have to happen and you know people with privilege and education